Welcome everyone to uh, this week's uh, Durham Geometry and Topology Seminar. So it's a pleasure to uh, present uh, Luis Hernandez La Moneda. He's a professor at CIMAT in Guanajuato in Mexico and also at the University of uh, Santiago de Compostela in, in Spain. So we're very happy to, to uh, have him in the seminar and he's going to talk about uh, Banach's uh, isometric uh, problem. So. Well, thank you very much, Fernando, for the invitation. Sorry that I couldn't be there. Well, neither are you, but sorry, we could not all be at Duran to have a normal seminar. Still, I hope that uh, you'll enjoy this. And please, um, yeah, stop me and ask questions. Okay. So, oops. Okay, so, so the problem starts as a problem in, in functional analysis. So, so this, the setup is, uh, we start with a real Banach space, so a vector space together with a norm in such a way that this norm makes it a complete metric space. And and I fix uh, n, which is some finite dimension. And the main hypothesis for, for the problem is that all n-dimensional subspaces of V are isometric to each other. So recall that two subspaces are isometric if there's a linear isomorphism that preserves the norm. So uh, Banach's problem then says, uh, is this hypothesis enough to guarantee that V with this norm is a Hilbert space? In other words, whether this norm is coming really from an inner product, okay? And then notice that the converse is, clearly true, no? If we start with a, with some Hilbert space and you take any, any N and then you look at a, a, a subspace of dimension N and you restrict the inner product, any two of them will be isometric, no? You just have to send one orthonormal basis of one to an orthonormal basis of the other one, okay? so. Okay, so then, um, so Banach, what was really asking is whether this is a characterization for Hilbert spaces, okay? So the following, which is quite elementary, would be important. Um, let me move this down here. So, Yes, so, so the fact that this is Hilbert is equivalent to, to the norm satisfying the, the usual parallelogram law that we learned in high school. No, so if you have a norm that satisfies the parallelogram law, then by polarization will determine an inner product. Okay, so then with this in mind, um, then let me tell you how this uh, um, Banach's question uh, really reduces to a co-dimension one question. So, so it, it goes like this. So suppose that, that Banach's problem has a positive answer for fixed n and, and for every norm space of dimension n plus one, then uh, Let's see that it will be true for that same n and any Banach space. Okay. So okay. So so we're assuming this. So then, what this says is that if you take now a subspace W of B of dimension n plus one, it will be Hilbert. Okay, because all of its all of its subspaces of dimension n 
all of its hyperplanes will be isometric between themselves. And so by hypothesis, then W will be Hilbert. Okay. Now take any two vectors in V and look at the span of X and Y. This span will be inside some W of dimension N plus one. I mean, N is at least two. Okay. But now since W is Hilbert, then this X and Y will satisfy the parallelogram law. But since X and Y were arbitrary, that means that any pair of vectors inside of V satisfies the parallelogram law. So V is Hilbert. Yeah, is this, is this clear? See? <laughs> okay. So, uh, so it's enough to answer Banach's problem uh, for each n and every norm on R on, on Rn plus one. Okay, so then, okay. So, so then let me just say a little bit about the history of the problem. So Banach asked this question in his 1932 book. So he has a section where he's wanted to you know, give properties that characterize Hilbert spaces. And one of them was this, one of these questions. Um, then uh, very soon in 1935, it was proved for n equal to two. Then in 57, Boretsky proved it for all n, but for infinite dimensional Banach spaces. And then the first time it was really solved for every Banach space was in 1967, where Gromov proved it for all even n, and almost proved it for the odd ones also, except he needed to assume that V had at least co-dimension two. Okay, so then the co-dimension one case for odd n uh, was open since 1967. And then recently, together with these uh, Mexican mathematicians, we proved uh, that it's also true for half of the remaining cases. So for every n, which is congruent to one mod four, except for 133. And I would, I, I would tell you where the 133 is coming from. Maybe you wanna guess. You wanna guess, Fernando? Do you know? <coughs> eh? With something with Lie groups, isn't it? Or yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I <know>. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll 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 I'll, I'll say. Um, okay. So so then this uh, analysis problem has a has a geometric reformulation, which is as follows. So. So look at B, the unit ball of this norm space. It's uh, what is called a convex body. So it's convex, compact with non-empty interior. And it's also symmetric, okay? Minus B is B. And then, you know, a few basic facts are that V as a norm space, is determined by this unit ball. Two norm spaces are isometric if and only if there's a linear isomorphism between them that sends the ball on the first to onto the ball on the second one. Okay, so since we'll be using this, we have a name for this. So we'll say that B1 and B2 are linearly equivalent. Okay, so linearly equivalent two convex sets are linearly equivalent if there's a, an isomorphism between the vector spaces where they live, uh, sending one into the other, okay? And then finally, uh, 
one way of saying that V is a Hilbert space is the same as saying that V is isometric to Euclidean Rn, which is the same as saying that the unit ball of V is linearly equivalent to the usual unit ball in Euclidean space. So we say that B is an ellipsoid. Okay, so, so it really is telling you that B is the image on their uh, isomorphism of Rn of the unit ball. So it's an ellipsoid. Okay. Or well, maybe one, this is the definition of ellipsoid for this talk. So it's that clear then. <clears throat> so then Banach's question is equivalent to this geometric problem. Uh, you have some symmetric convex body B in Rn plus one, such that all of its hyperplane sections, so like this and this, are linearly equivalent to each other. So then is that enough to guarantee that B is an ellipsoid? Okay. Is that, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay. So, okay. So then I want to, I want to give you um, an idea of how, how one proves this. Okay. How one proves that really it, it, it is an ellipsoid in the dimension that I said before when, when, when N is a, 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 of the form for K plus one. Okay, so, so the hypothesis of the problem says that there is some fixed symmetric convex body K. So think of this as you fix one of the slices, one of the sections, and you put it aside. Okay, so, and then any other hyperplane section is linearly equivalent to this K. Okay, so there's some linear isomorphism between Rn and uh, the hyper, each hyperplane sending K to, to this uh, section. Okay, and now, um, okay, once you've done this, uh, once you've fixed this uh, reference uh, K, define G sub K as the isomorphisms of Rn that leave K invariant. Okay, so the group of linear symmetries of K. Okay, so, so this is the this is the key lemma. This is what Gromov uh, realized, discovered, which is that SN, the sphere SN, admits a GK structure. So before giving you a, a, a proof of, of this lemma, just let me remind you what a, what a G structure uh, on a manifold is basically, I don't know, but, uh, probably everybody knows, I don't know, maybe for the sake of students or, um, and then also give you some of the, the most basic examples of G structures on, on spheres. Okay, so then, uh, okay, so briefly recall that the frame bundle on, on a manifold M is some principal bundle F, it's a principal GLNR bundle. And the fiber over each point uh, parametrizes all frames of, of the tangent space at that point. Okay, so it's basically parametrizing all, all bases of, of this tangent space. It's a, it's a principal bundle for this group and the, the the way the, it acts is, 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 is very natural. I mean, if you take a frame and, and an isomorphism of Rn, then you pre-compose the frame with, the, with this isomorphism. Okay, and then, uh, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
it's a principal bundle, meaning it, it's also locally trivial. So local is like an open cross the group and the local is, is diffeomorphic to that and, diffe and, and the diffeomorphism is, is equivalent with respect to the you know, multiplication of GLNR with itself, the, 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 the usual multiplication GLNR. Okay, so then once you know the, the frame bundle, then a G structure is a reduction of the structure group of the bundle to G. So that is, it's a, it's like some, to take G will be a, a closely subgroup of GLNR. And it's just some G principal bundle, which happens to be a sub bundle of the, of the, <clears throat> of the bundle of, of frames. So, so each fiber of P, so, so each fiber of P is like some subset of the frames, which is in correspondence with the group G. Okay, basically, if you want. Okay. Uh, let me give you, ah, okay. And then there's something important that I, I'll, I'll use and it's also maybe also perhaps for some of you is more familiar, um, which is this clutching construction for SN. So an equivalent way to define a G structure for SN is, is the following. Um, is what is called the characteristic function of the frame bundle. So, so this frame bundle, when you restrict it to, to each hemisphere of, of the sphere is trivial, okay? And so F really only depends on the gluing, uh, on a gluing function, which is defined on the equator, okay? And in fact, it only depends on the homotopy type of this, of this, gluing, of this gluing function. And then, uh, if you think of, 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 of it in this, in this form, then a G structure is nothing more than a map from the, you know, a gluing function. So it has to be homotopic whose image lies inside of G. Okay, so you're just using elements in this group in this subgroup G to, to glue the frame bond, okay? Uh, maybe you've seen it instead for the tangent bundle. Okay, so it's the same. So then uh, some examples of basic G structures. I hope this doesn't, it's not too, too elementary so far. So, so a Riemannian metric and an orientation uh, gives you an SON structure on SN. And if you want, how you find the, the structure is to just look at the frames. You know, you, you, you look just, you, you, you look at the frames which are orientation preserving and that an isometric. Okay, once you have fixed on our end the usual inner product and the standard orientation. Okay, so this determines an so a structure. Okay, also, if the sphere is, is of dimension, of odd dimension, then we know that the sphere will admit a non-vanishing vector field. In fact, a vector field of norm one. Okay, so then you can refine this, this, uh, this, this previous this structure and, and look at the and look at the frames which not only are orientation preserving isometries, but that map the last vector of Rn, they map it to, to X. Okay, so, so then this is giving you an SO n minus one structure. Okay, is that right? So it gives you this splitting of the tangent bundle, so some line bundle and it's orthogonal complement. And this corresponds to this SO n minus one, okay? <clears throat> and then something to keep in mind, which sounds now a little bit mysterious, is that okay, so I've reduced the group, I've, re I've, I've, I've reduced the structure group to SON minus one, but SON minus one still is a big group. Um, and 
So big enough to act transitively on SN minus two, okay? Let me give you another example. So another example is again for, for odd N, we can think of the sphere as the unit sphere in CK plus one, and thus look at it as this uh, homogeneous space, SUK plus one. And then using this uh, isotropy representation of SUK, one can show that SN admits an SUK structure. Okay, so, so, so if you want, now you, you have a group, which perhaps is even smaller than before, but as you can still is big enough to act transitively on SN minus two. Okay. Now there are other examples, for example, uh, say for the all, for the odd dimensions, but congruent to three mod four, the same idea will give you an SPK structure. In this case, SPK will not act transitively on SN minus two. And then for example, for S3 and S7, which is the most dramatic examples, the, tan the tangent bundle is trivial. So they admit an, I, you know, the, the, the trivial group structure, which of course is, is very small, okay? <laughs> so, so something to keep in mind is that we're going to, to want to know that if SN admits a G structure, then G is large, okay? Um, so, this is, um, so this is the reason why, why the, the things I'm going to tell you work uh, for all dimensions which are congruent to one mod four, but not for the other ones, okay? So far, okay, Fernando, is it, is it fine? Yeah, I think so, okay. yeah, I think. Okay, so then let me tell you about this um, Grom of Lemma. So recall, we have um, this K was this uh, model com com convex, which is linearly equivalent to all the sections of this bigger convex B. And we're looking at its, group of symmetries and we want to, to show that SN admits an S, a, a GK structure. So the proof is, is the following. So for each X in this, on the sphere, we can identify the tangent space at X with the hyperplane X perp. And so the, G, the GK structure is as follows. Look at the frames. So it's isomorphisms between Rn and X perp that map K onto the section, okay? So X perp, think of X perp now as a, as a hyperplane in Rn plus one intersects B in, in some section. And I want phi to be a linear equivalence between K and this and this section. And then we know that this PX is non is, is non-empty. That's those are the Banach hypothesis. Okay. And then it's also clear that it, it's a GK, it's a it's a it's a GK structure. Okay. If, if I pre-compose uh, any of these files with a with a with a symmetry of K, well again, this this will have this property. Okay. So that's it, okay? Yes, so then, uh, okay, so, so this is what links this geometric problem with the topology of the sphere. So then now some, some, some remarks. Since K is compact, it's a convex body, so it's compact with non-empty interior, then its group of symmetries is going to be compact. And then every compact group is, a, is conjugate to a subgroup of, of the orthogonal group, okay, first of all. And the second thing is, <coughs> if you have a G structure on a manifold and on a 10, then it will also have 
And if you look at the connected component of the identity, it will also have a G naught structure. I mean, if you think of the G structure, um, you know, in this clutching construction, so it was this map from the equator uh, into, into G. Since the equator is, is connected, the image is connected. So even so, it, li it lies not only inside of G, but it lies inside of the connected component of the identity. Okay, so then uh, we don't lose anything by assuming GK to be connected. And then the other thing is, if we change, okay, so if we change K by some isomorphic copy of it, then we'll change the isometry, the symmetry group of this, of this, uh, isomorphic copy by a conjugation. So what, what that means is that we might well assume by changing K, if necessary, that GK is contained in, in, in ON first and since it's connected in SON. Is that clear, this reduction? Okay, so, so the only thing it says here is GK is, is conjugate to a subgroup, but by changing K, with an isomorphic image, then we can actually make its, its symmetry group inside of ON. And then by looking at this connected component of the identity, then it's in fact inside of SON, okay? <clears throat> so the intuitive idea of this lemma is the following, is that this, uh, to each X looking at X perp intersection B dissection defines a field of potatoes, okay, so similar to, to the vector field, and this field of potatoes is what is inducing the GK structure. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, okay, and then, um, so, 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 so what I said a little bit earlier, we'll see that for, for this uh, dimension, the fact that SN admits uh, GK structure will be will say that GK is large. Then in turn, that will say that K is very symmetric. And so all the sections of B will be very symmetric. Okay. And somehow uh, with that, one uh, hopes to prove that B is an ellipsoid. Okay. So I put a summer. I don't know if I need to, you need the summarizing or? Or is that okay? Um, I don't know if I've repeated myself a lot. Maybe you, should, uh, you could explain what Oho is. <laughs> in the... Oho is like, yeah, it's like, like what, I don't know, watch oh, out, uh, oh, yes. remark or, or, or look, look. Eh? Right. Okay, so, so then let me tell you how, so, okay. So then I have a SN and I have a G structure and I want to conclude that G is big, okay? And then this G is a subset of, is a subgroup of SON. So we'll have two, two, two options. Okay, so SON um, uh, has its standard representation in RN, okay? If, and and so since GK is a is a is a subgroup, uh, GK is acting on RN also by restricting this representation. So then this representation will e either be reducible or, or or reducible. Okay, and so it's reducible if there is a uh, some invariant subspace proper uh, proper invariant subspace, and it's irreducible if if it if it does if it's not. Okay, so. If there are no proper invariant subspaces, okay. So, so then one needs to take to deal with these two cases separately. So, first the reducible case, which is uh, by far the simplest, and I will just so that you get the flavor of that. It's really basic. Uh, I mean, most of the things I'm going to, to say are really basic uh, algebraic topology things that one learns in, 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 in graduate school. Um, 
so so I'll, I'll I'll show you in this with this one uh, and I won't bother in the rest of the cases so 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 suppose that GK um, is acting reducibly on Rn so you decompose Rn as a sum of two invariant subspaces in principle they could be also further reduced we don't know but okay so it, it decomposes like this and uh, let's say U is bigger dimensional, okay? And dimension of U1 is at least one. Okay, so, so, so to this decomposition of, of the standard representation, there, um, it corresponds to the decomposition of the, of the tangent bundle, okay? Because it's the bundle associated to, to, the, to the frame bundle and the standard representation. So, so the tangent bundle decomposes as a sum. And now, um, so, but, but, but there's a theorem of Steenrod from 1951 that tells you that if the dimension is congruent to one mod four, then this splitting necessarily is, this has dimension one, this has dimension n minus one, and it cannot be further split. That's it, okay? So in particular, it's telling you that GK is up to conjugacy, is a subgroup of the standard SON minus one, okay? So, uh, so this is, I mean, this is one dimension, it's going to be, it's going to be trivial. So, and, and here's the standard SON minus one, but it's, it, and it cannot be inside of SON minus two, okay? If it, if it were inside SON minus two, then you would have a, a, an N minus two piece invariant, okay? Okay, so from, this, from these two things, we want to conclude that G acts transitively on SN minus two. So the idea goes like this, <clears throat> so, so look at the vibration for SN minus two and look at this map. So the inclusion of G followed by the projection. So this composition is nothing more. I mean, the image of this composition is nothing more than the orbit of the North pole of SN minus two under G. Okay, I'm, I'm identifying this SON minus two, the isotrope with the isotropy of the North Pole of the sphere. So then uh, this map will be on to is the same thing as saying that G acts transitively on SN minus two, okay? So then, so suppose this is not, okay? So suppose it doesn't act transitively, then the map is not on to, but if it's not on to, it's null homotopic. So there's some homotopy between it and, and the constant North Pole, okay? So you can leave the homotopy because this is a vibration, okay? So you have this, you have this, uh, you have this di commutative diagram. And then uh, look at Fx, the, this lift of the homotopy uh, at one. I sit here. So since the homotopy f of you know f x comma one is the constant north north pole of S n minus two, that means that this Im the image of this is inside of S o n minus two. Okay. But now look at this uh, diagram. So look at the the characteristic map. So we are assuming that we have a G structure post-compound with this F, okay? This diagram here tells you that is homotopic, this to, to the inclusion. So then that tells you that this map here is, is, a, is homotopic to, to, to the characteristic map. And so it's giving you uh, a, a, a structure for the sphere. It's giving you an SON minus two structure. Okay, because it's it's a map homotopy to chi, to chi and whose image is inside of this group. Okay, so the clutching construction tells you this is a, 
an SON minus two structure, but Steenrod's theorem, this is that says that this is impossible. So, okay, so this is a contradiction. The contradiction comes from assuming that the action was not transitive. Okay. So, um, so again, this was up to conjugacy. So again, by replacing K by some linearly equivalent copy of it, we can assume that GK acts transitively on the standard SN minus two sphere inside RN minus one. And so we have this picture. So what this is, so what this is telling you is that K is a solid of revolution. Okay, so so remember you have we have this this um, convex body K inside of RN. Look at RN minus one. Look at a point here where it intersects. Then uh, look at the orbit under the group GK. So we know that GK acts transitively on the sphere. So that means that is going to be a sphere. This is going. This this orbit is going to be a sphere. Is going to be inside of K, because it's a group of symmetries of K, and so by convexity it has to be exactly the boundary of K intersected with this R n minus one. Okay, so that means that K intersection R n minus one is going to be this ball, a ball. Not only that, this axis, the action on this axis is trivial. Okay, so GK was contained in the standard SON minus one. That was part of the thing we, we show. So that means that um, if you translate this RN minus one up or down, the intersection with K is going to be also a ball. Okay, so that's what it means for, for K to be a, a solid of revolution. So it has this axis that is fixed and transversely to this axis, you get this, these balls. Okay, is that okay? So, so this is a, so we, so, 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 so this shows that a, just the dimension hypothesis and assuming that GK acts reducibly uh, on Rn, then K itself has to be a solid of revolution. Okay, but now we have the reducible case. So, so same thing. So, but now assuming that GK acts irreducibly. So let me show you an example. Um, of yeah, how things could go wrong. And this again, I mean, this is probably well known to most of you, but perhaps for some of the students don't know, and it's probably maybe it's worthwhile giving. So this is the SO3 reducible representation in dimension five. So, <clears throat> so take n equal five, think of R5 as a, Symmetric traceless uh, three by three matrices. SO3, the three by three orthogonal of the determinant one. And SO3 is acting linearly, so it's a representation acting just by conjugation. Okay. And okay, so look at so, so, so it's acting in this star five linearly, so it's correspond to some subgroup of GL, L, uh, GL five. But now you have uh, this inner product, which is just trace of AB, basically Euclidean product on R five, and it's easy to see that the SO three is acting by isometries. So then H will be inside of SO five. Okay, it's connected. So, so now some elementary argument, diagonalizing, and shows that in fact, uh, <clears throat> this is an irreducible representation. So this is the irreducible representation of SO3 in dimension five. But nevertheless, SO3 is too small to, to act on SN minus two, which happens to be S3 in this case. Okay, so three is also dimension three, it's RP3, so it's a quotient of S3. 
So, okay, so then one, so, 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 so in the scheme of things, I would need to get rid of this example. So I would need to show somehow that the sphere S5 does not admit um, an H structure. So that the SO3 reducible representation is not an A, is, is, is not a G structure for S5. Okay. And actually, I mean it's one knows that SO3 has an irreducible representation in every odd dimension. So so you see, one, one needs to take care of all, all of these examples and other than appear, and you cannot, I, I mean, there, there's, there's no argument of the tangent bundle splitting anymore because the, actual, the, the, the representation is irreducible. Okay. So then the theorem that solves, you know, the, the, that answers this is the following almost, I put almost because of this N133. So is. Um, <clears throat> So if, if n is congruent to one mod four, G containing SON close connected acting irreducibly, uh, if SN admits a G structure, then either it's the whole of, S, of SON or N is 133 and G is a subgroup of H, which is the adjoint representation of the simple exceptional Lie group E7. So this exceptional Lie group uh, appears and it's something exactly like this example, like, like this, I mean, there's no way to get rid of it except proving by hand that the sphere of dimension 133 will not have a G structure for, for this age and we don't know how to do that, okay? So, but except for this case, except for this dimension, in any other dimension, G will be the whole of SON. So that means that, you know, the symmetry group of K is the whole SON, so K is a ball. Okay? So, so what that tells you is that independently of whether GK is acting reducibly or irreducibly, in these dimensions, then K will be a solid of revolution. Okay. Is that okay? Fernando? Yes, yes. Um. Bueno. So let me see now. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, 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 so how, I go until when? Until Just to go, it's uh, three? Seven until yeah five uh, fifty five. But okay, so then um, okay. So let me quickly tell you more or less the idea. Okay, so 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 okay. So the idea is to to get rid of every close connected proper subgroup of S O N, which acts irreducibly on R N and which could be a G structure. Okay, under this dimension hypothesis. Okay, so then. There are the following, there's this, a bunch of lemmas uh, from algebraic topology. One is that uh, N cannot be very large compared to the dimension of G. Okay, so for example, this will take care of all these representations of SO3 for big N, okay? This is an easy ar argument basically using um, you know, um, the long homotopy sequence of a vibration and so, so, so again, some standard things. Then there's this uh, result by Leonard, which tells you that if G is also maximal, then it will have to be a simple Lie group. This uses some classification of dinking of, of, of maximal subgroups of SON. And again, then there's some algebraic topology, which is not, um, yeah, not, 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 well, I don't know, not too difficult, at least I can understand. And then there's this more recent result of Chadek and Krab. I think Krab is a colleague of yours in Scotland. Um, 
which tells you that if n is bigger than or equal to nine, then G will not be a classical group, okay? So this, this takes care of a bunch of groups. So, so not SOK, not SUM, and not SPM, okay? And the proof of this, I don't understand, okay? So it's, again, it's some algebraic topology, but this is, is beyond me, okay? So then let me tell you how to use this to, to, to prove and where is this 133 coming? So, so we are assuming n is bigger than or equal to nine in order to use Chadex and Krabs result. So, so we have this G containing SON acting irreducibly. So of course, G will be inside some maximal subgroup H. Okay, so we take H to be maximal and connected. And now the following is, is clear. If, if the if the structure group of SN reduces to G, so if there's a G structure, then it will also reduce to H. There's also an H structure. And, and also, if G is acting irreducibly, well, H, which is bigger, also is acting irreducibly, okay? So if I can prove that, that no H structure exists, well then, for any group inside of H, there will not be any any G structure, okay? So then Leonard is telling us that H has to be simple. Chadek and Krab tell us that H is not a classical group. So then the only remaining options is that it's a spin or one of the exceptional, five exceptional E groups. Okay, so, okay, so then, uh, let me complexify this, this real representation. Since this real representation is of uh, odd dimension, its complexification still is irreducible. Okay, so then we can use the theory of irreducible complex representations. Now, this example you, you probably all know. Um, I mean, one knows, it's a very basic fact, what are all the irreducible complex representations of SU2? No, one knows is there's one, exactly one uh, in each complex dimension. And then those that uh, factor through SO3 are the ones that are of odd dimension. These are the ones that I, I said before, no? that give, gives you all the, the irreducible SO3 representation. So the ones that do not factor through SO3 are all even dimensional. Okay, so this is true for a spin three, but then again, there's a, there's a lemma that tells you that this is still so for all the other spins. So, so every complex irreducible that does not factor through SOM has even dimension. So that means that the only irreducible representations that matter for our problem of you know, spin M represent, are the ones that factor through SOM, but SOM is a classical group, so it's taken care by Chadek and Krav. I mean, except SO3 in SO5, okay? But for any other ones, it's taken care of. So then that brings us to the exceptional Lie groups. So, so we know that there is this general bound, you know, what is N and, and the dimension of the group, and then, you, you go and you make a table. So this table tells you, I, I've, I've written here, the dimension of each of the simple groups. And then here, it's uh, the dimensions of the first, you know, the smallest uh, uh, irreducible representations for each group. And then I put in red, the very first one, uh, that is a number which is of the form 4k plus one. So you see in every case is way too big for the group, except for E7. So E7, um, yeah, the problem is that E7 is 133, it's, it's its dimension. It's a simple group, so it's adjoint representation is uh, irreducible, so this uh, is potentially could appear and we don't know how to, to get rid of it, okay? So, okay. And then finally, one has to take care of, 
of the SO3 representation of dimension five. And this was a, a real pain. I won't say anymore, but, um, but okay. But it, 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 it's true that, that it doesn't appear. And then just to finish very quickly. So how does one uh, finishes the, the proof of the problem? So, so let me just tell you. So, so you have this B you have a symmetric, it's a symmetric convex body. All of its hyperplane sections are linearly equivalent to some fixed solid of revolution. And you want to show that it's an ellipsoid. Okay, so you need to prove the following. So under the same hypothesis, what you show is that at least one of the sections is an ellipsoid. Okay, if you show this, then now, um, the proof of this uh, Banach's isometric problem is very easy because one of them is an ellipsoid, but all of them are linearly equivalent to each other. So that means that all of them are ellipsoids. Now remember that being an ellipsoid means that the hyperplane, it's a Hilbert space. So then you're showing that all the hyperplanes are Hilbert, but then as we said before, that shows that the space, the whole space is Hilbert and that finishes the, the thing. And so then really the, the, the key is to prove this proposition. And I won't tell you how it is done. I mean, it's not too, too deep, but there's, there's no more time, but um, one needs to use the following idea. The idea that if you have some um, convex uh, body, that is a, a solid of revolution in two different ways, then it has to be an ellipsoid. And the idea is very simple, is because each, each axis of revolution will give you a, a, a group of symmetries, which is uh, conjugate to the standard SON minus one. So you will have two of those groups, two different ones, but SON minus one is a maximal subgroup of SON. So if you have two of them, it, it implies that then the, the group of symmetries is all of SON. So then that means that K will be an ellipsoid. And then once you have that, you prove it by contradiction. You assume that no, no, uh, no section is an ellipsoid. And so each section has a unique axis of revolution. And this axis will define you some line, line, uh, line bundle on SN. And then these line bundles are always trivial. So you will have some um, unit vector field, psi. Uh, and okay, and you'll have to, yeah, with this, you, you know, it's, it's kind of a, like these proofs of a, it's like a, like a, like a, one of these uh, classical proofs um, in algebraic topology. Uh, but together with some convex geometric argument to, to reach a contradiction. Okay, I'm sorry that I had to rush again. Okay. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you.